Hello, good morning, good afternoon, whatever time it is that you're joining us today. This is day two of our Nonprofit Power Week with Ide Bailey, specifically with Kyle Hendrickson. So he's joining us uh, yesterday, today, and all the days of this week as we move forward for this Nonprofit Power Week with Ide Bailey. For those of you that joined us yesterday, we did have a live audience. Unfortunately, they're not with us today, but hopefully they're joining us just like you and they're here virtually. So today, Kyle's gonna talk to us about nonprofits being held hostage with ransomware and what that looks like for our NPOs around our country. So as we move forward in today's conversation, we of course want to remind you who we are. Um, so Julia Patrick, hello to you, Good CEO morning. of the American Nonprofit Academy. And I'm Jarrett Ransom, your nonprofit nerd, CEO of the Raven Group. And we are honored to be here day in and day out to be of service with our presenting sponsors. Again, huge shout out to Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy at National University, Be Generous, Your Part-Time Controller, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, and The Nonprofit Nerd. We are marching, get ready for this, towards our 700th episode. So Julia started this in March of 2020 with me, but she coaxed me in saying it was going to be uh, two weeks. Ooh. And so I think I'm being held ransom on some... <laughs> On some occasions, but you can find all of our episodes and archive just plentiful on Roku, YouTube, Amazon Fire TV, as well as Vimeo. And for those of you that are podcast listeners, and we learned that Kyle, our guest is as well, you can listen to the nonprofit show wherever you stream your podcast. So as we move into today's conversation, Kyle, again, we are thrilled to have you here so glad that we didn't scare you away yesterday. You did a fantastic job yeah. kicking off with those top five tips for us. So again, Kyle's joining us, Director of Cybersecurity at Ide Bailey. Welcome back. Awesome. Thank you for having me back again. I'm glad that I didn't scare you away yesterday. <laughs> Well, no, not a chance, not a chance, although you did give us some like scary things to think about. And um, it, it's really it was amazing. You were a great sport. As Jarrett mentioned, we did our very first live studio audience remote. Now, Jarrett's done some live remotes for us before at the big um, Association of Fundraising Professionals conference that was held in Vegas. But this was really interesting because we actually had people, you know, behind us in the audience. And so, Kyle, that was fabulous. And we were really, really honored that you would uh, roll with the flow. And, and it was really a lot of fun. So thank you. Very cool. Well, I'm, I'm excited about today. Um, hopefully I can bring that same level of energy today as well. Well, I say let's get into it because... We're talking about ransomware, which is such a frightening concept, and we're going to get into this more. But what is ransomware and what are like the most common types that we can be that we should be on the lookout for? Yeah. So just to start it off, ransomware is what a malicious actor is using. It's a type of software that they're getting on your systems. And what it's doing is it's encrypting the data and then uh, in some cases, stealing that data. And with that encryption that it's doing, it's preventing you from accessing that data and it's holding it for ransom, hence ransomware. And they're asking for a payment for them to release that data back to you so you can access your systems again. And so how this normally manifests itself within an environment is uh, someone clicks on a phishing email or maybe we had... Uh, improperly configured our systems or our network, which allowed an intruder in, they get that malicious code to run in our environment. And then all of a sudden we see the pop-up message on our computer that says, hey, you can't access anything and we'd really like to be paid so that we can give you access again. Um, so that's generally how it goes down. Now, some of these threat actors are pivoting uh, they are going to just extortion only business models. So they'll just steal the money and then ask for payment 
so that they can delete the data and not release it publicly. If you don't pay it, they release it publicly. So this, in the case of a nonprofit, might be our donor information. It might be the people that we're serving. Um, it's it's all the data that we are trusted per, to protect. Um, they're releasing that or extorting you so that they won't release it, along with the typical preventing access to normal um, IT type systems, the, our accounting systems, our, our, how we serve our clients, all that. Kyle, how often does something like this yeah. happen? Yeah. Uh, so this is happening all the time. So this is uh, one of the, so this and business email compromise are two of the largest cyber threats that we face as a nation. And so when we look at ransomware across the world, and, and I can only go off of reported statistics. So when we look worldwide, North America, or specifically the United States, is 40, 44% of all ransomware cases in the world are targeted at the United States. So this is, this is a very much an us problem. Yeah. Uh, I like that pun there. U.S. us problem. <laughs> Good job, Kyle. <laughs> I, I know I can only imagine that that is just so frightening. But you, my friend, yesterday gave us so many messages of hope, and you're going to do that again today. I'm sure is to have some messages of hope for our nonprofits. Um, so when we do encounter this because like you said it's happening all the time which sadly means it's probably happening right now mm -hmm. uh, you know as we are having this conversation when do we share that information like do we share it internally with our staff and then externally with our stakeholders or what do you recommend yeah so the first step is to have a plan right um we want to work to a plan. To a plan, we don't want to just uh, run around uh, with our hair on fire and just not know what to do because we do have potentially some legal or regulatory uh, requirements for disclosures. So, nearly every state in our nation has breach notification laws. Along with, uh, depending on what industry you're in, you may have regulatory requirements to notify your regulatory body or uh, just a certain time frame with notifying people. Um, this also is further complicated because it's based on where the clients you're serving or where the people you have data on live, where they reside. And that can be further complicated because it, let's say someone is in uh, Europe for a vacation or for an extended period of time, but their their mailing address technically is in the United States, they may potentially still be subject to GDPR, so European data uh, yeah. regulations. So this can be a mess. So this is where, uh, when we start talking about how do we notify, how do we transparently tell everybody that a incident has went down, uh, we want to make sure we have a plan. We're working with uh, a marketing or a PR firm or someone like that so that we can have our internal messaging consistent and our external messaging consistent. We also want to be making sure that if we do have cybersecurity insurance, we're working with a breach attorney that is a part of that plan so that we know that we're following all legal requirements that we have so we're not opening ourselves up to further liability wow okay i would have never guessed that this would have been um the path that you drew for us it makes me think that this is something and you kind of touched on this yesterday um you need to have your ducks in a row and this plan as you just started stated needs to be in full force before anything else because this is this is too arduous just to think on the fly what okay this has happened what do we do now you need to have that plan yep. and, and it's affecting it this is affecting our, our friends our neighbors our communities and and everybody around us um, because when we look at ransomware specifically for those companies who have been through ransomware 25 percent have been forced to close for a period of time while they're recovering the the <laughs> regular recovery sure. time the average is somewhere right around three weeks and it can be anywhere from 20 to 21 days is where i've seen the recent studies but this is 
losing access to your systems, to your IT, to everything you use to run the business in a technology era that we live in, what happens if you lose access to those systems and for extended periods of time? I feel like there needs to be a crisis <laughs> communication plan for all organizations, probably all businesses, right? For profit, not for profit. And then the scenarios in, in which, you know, the crisis communication then is implemented and, and taken into effect. Um, and you're right, Kyle, that message, you know, I, again, yesterday, for those of you that watched, you know, we kicked off nonprofit Power Week with Kyle, um, our, our new bestie, uh, yesterday. And, you know, I learned for the first time of the cybersecurity insurance. And so my first call would probably be to that insurance provider um, to then, you know, determine what needs to happen for our next steps. And I'm, I'm assuming that they too have some boilerplate language that can guide you in this communication. Is that a correct assumption, Kyle? Yes. So they're, they, we want to make sure that when we're doing our testing, so we want to talk through this before it actually happens. Right. And we call that a tabletop test. And when we're doing that, it is okay to be asking our insurance carrier uh, if they have resources to participate in that, observe and make recommendations based on what they've seen in the past. So that's an okay thing to ask of your insurance carrier. It's right. also okay to ask, of other uh, business professionals that your uh, organization is working with. So whether that's a, an outsourced uh, controller or an outsourced uh, CFO or whoever is helping you with the finance side of things, they may have leadership expertise that they can lean on uh, for things that they've seen in the past as well. So I would, I would reach out to all of those other places that you already have a business relationship with or a trusted professional you can work with that has been through these types of things for guidance and if they would sit in on a tabletop test. Great. Love that. Now, I I want to go back to something because um, you mentioned something just now that I had never heard of until we started this discussion this week about a breach attorney. Talk to us a little bit more about that because I'm fascinated by that concept and it seems to me like that could really save a lot of future angst if you have this, you know, this member on your team, so to speak, before it happens. Yeah. So this isn't something that you normally staff for. This is something that when you have cybersecurity insurance, or if you don't, if you have uh, your plan in place, you'll have identified those people who already know the legal requirements mm -hmm. for notifying people if there is a breach of information. So these are these are lawyers that specify or that specialize in uh, breach notification law and cybersecurity incidents. So these are smart people, they know what's up, they know all of the different regulations and requirements between all of the different states and all of the different countries that the people you're serving may be residing in. And not every state, not every country has the same requirements. Some may require within 48 hours, some might be within a week, it may have different definitions of what a breach is. They may have different definitions of what private information is. So they may not all agree on if it was a breach based on their different definitions of what is considered sensitive information. So there's a lot of things to be considering uh, when you're going through this, but having that trusted resource, uh, and again, most likely through your cybersecurity insurance policy is, is key to make sure you're not uh, subject to further, uh, whether it's uh, I don't know if it's civil. I'm not smart enough to know if it's civil or, or criminal, but there's legal requirements around this. So, yeah. so let me ask you a follow up question to that, because um, so often our accounting partners find internal fraud and financial mismanagement would be would these be the same types of talents, legal talent that would actually be able to interface with you outside of the cyber um security issue but just in general fraud or is this really more drilled down to the cybersecurity? this is really drilled down to cybersecurity. Okay. so those people would be a good resource um, but again we're going to want to uh, find somebody in the legal profession that actually specializes in breach notifications okay 
I feel like there needs to be some, and maybe there are, and maybe I'm just not privy to this information, some roundtable discussions with other nonprofit peers about, you know, cybersecurity and being transparent with the stakeholders, because this, no one is immune to this. Like everyone, you know, this, this could potentially happen to Absolutely. Any organization. And as we learned yesterday, I believe the number that you shared with us, Kyle, was a quarter of a million dollars is like the the dollar impact. Is that could you school me on that again? Yeah. So uh, so I'm losing information from a study from the group IB uh, out of 2022. So they look back through 2020. So this is current data. So this is the most recent data that I have in front of me. And the average ransom demand was $247,000. And and that's increased 45% since 2020. That is terrifying. And as we, as we mentioned again yesterday, and for those of you that are thinking, man, I missed a lot yesterday. That's okay. You you can go back and watch it. Um, But that, as we talked about, you know, that could shut doors that could really close down the organization and make a severe impact in the community. It just takes away from the funds that we have to support our organization and continue our mission of helping people. We're, we're all in the nonprofit space to help people. And when we have unplanned expenses like this, it takes away from our mission. Absolutely. Now let's move on to, I mean, one of the things, and Jared alluded to this earlier, um, you were really specific in that you were here to deliver messages of hope when it all seemed like overwhelming. So you're telling us that we can do some things to prevent ransomware attacks. What would that look like? Yeah, so I think I mentioned yesterday that this isn't magic and and you can't just jump to the end of the Monopoly board. You can't just pass go, get your 200 bucks and and skip all the way to the end. Um, It doesn't work that way. Uh, An adversary, uh, a malicious adversary has has to use the same laws of nature, the same laws of physics that we do Mm -hmm. as defenders, they don't have secret sauce. And what I mean by that is an adversary still has to get malicious code on an endpoint. They have to get that malware into your environment or take advantage of some other way of logging into a system. Um, They have to be able to uh, survive a reboot. So if they don't lose access, if a computer restarts, they have to be able to remote control that computer from somewhere over the internet because they're not physically in your office. Um, They have to be able to elevate privileges. They need to get more rights than what they have when they landed on a computer. Uh, They have to be able to find other computers to get to, and they have to leverage those other computers to continue discovering and going through that whole circle of that attack chain until they find enough computers to infect and encrypt, or they find the data that they can steal and then extort you for not releasing it to the public. So all of these different steps that it takes to get to disaster is an advantage for us as defenders because we don't have to be good or we don't have to be perfect in every single stage of the attack. We just have to be really good at enough of them to catch things as an incident before there's any notification requirements rather than waiting until disaster when we get all of this pain that's delivered upon us. I think that's fascinating. I think it's such an interesting... um process that you just walked us through and that it's not just like this one and done thing that it does take time and it is pretty um, substantial for the very fact that they're not sitting in your office and i think a lot of times when we think about fraud in the nonprofit sector and jared you and i've talked about this so much with different guests um, over this time is that you know it's it's betty lou in accounting or it's you know sammy volunteer that comes in every Tuesday. I mean, it, but in this situation, we never see these people. And so it's the sense of, of lack of control or filtering um, that I think is so dangerous for so many of us because we just out of sight, out of mind until it happens. 
Well, and the other thing I think about too, Julia, is, you know, so many people, when they start a nonprofit, they don't start it thinking, I want to do this because I really want to put a cybersecurity plan in place, right? <laughs> I mean, maybe some. Sorry, maybe Kyle. Kyle. <laughs> yeah. Kyle, you might have with an organization that you started because I'm certainly, you know, in your frame of, of mind, but, you know, so many organizations, the founders, the CEO, they, they just thrive in passion and this is not an area of expertise. So partnering with someone like I Bailey to really, you know, support, cause I, as you said yesterday, again, I'm referencing yesterday uh, is, you know, really looking at. Um, having those trusted advisors, you don't have to do this alone. And I think that's really comforting. Yeah. So I, I heard um, something just two days ago. So I, I forgot to bring this up yesterday. Um, okay. And it's a little bit ridiculous, but I think it kind of brings home the point. Um, and this was directly from a client. So compromise is inevitable, but it won't happen to me. Why? Because it's never happened before. Why would it happen now? <laughs> it's not going to be me that's the target. So I, I thought of uh, a different way to rephrase this. Um, so no experience in the life of the turkey prepares it for Thanksgiving. <laughs> Just because it hasn't happened to us in the past doesn't right. mean it isn't going to be happening to us in the future. And that wow. we don't have a reason to prepare and understand what these adversaries are doing yeah. so that we can make sure that we're protected. Well, and they're becoming, thank you for that, because that, <laughs> that's very um, poignant, I would say, but they're becoming more and more advanced. And one of the things during COVID is really this acceleration of technology. You know, I, I've mentioned my son probably more times than, than I want to count right now, but, you know, he's 12 and he's learning coding. And so there's so many other you know, um, individuals around the globe that are so very attuned to technology and the advancements of ransomware and cyber attacks and things like that. That's what's frightening to me yeah. is, you know, yes, it might not have happened to us yet, <laughs> but how do we prepare for that and prepare for the next like installment of what that might be? Because I feel like all of these you know, as we talked earlier, fishing, fishing, mishing, all, all of those kind of dumb words, they're becoming more and more advanced. So I think that's a good point. And when we start talking about that attack chain, those things that lead up to ransomware, those aren't exclusive to ransomware. These are the steps that all uh, advanced adversaries are taking in people's environments. They just have different goals at the end of that. So okay. when we start focusing in on these common things, there's common threads that extend across all um, adversaries as they're attempting to steal data or prevent our access to it or steal money from us. They're working through this attack chain. And so one of the things that from a very technical perspective that I like to reference is the MITRE attack framework. And so this is observations of all known attacks that have occurred in the past so that we can look at the past to help us better protect us in the future. Yeah. And it's framed out in that whole attack chain methodology so that we can start to look at what does initial access look like? What does that remote control look like? Mm -hmm. How do we need to defend ourselves? Yeah. So is that specific to our, like, sites, our organization, is that what you're saying? So that's, that's everybody. So that's not specific to nonprofits. This is looking at all attacks across all industries. Okay. So this is a, a huge body of knowledge that we can reference as computer professionals to make sure that we're building solutions secure upfront the right way at yeah. the beginning. Yeah, again, that prevention is, is so important. And that's one of the things, you know, we don't want our NPOs to, to be held hostage by ransomware. And 
um, these hopeful messages. You're going to be here all week to provide them. Um, so, so don't be alarmed. Those of you that are watching, listening, you know, this is really something that we're providing in partnership with I Bailey throughout the week uh, to really help you garner this insight, because we know that you show up with passion and purpose for your community, yeah. not to create a cybersecurity attack crisis communication plan. <laughs> Yeah, as much as you need one, I don't think that's new. That's not at the forefront of anyone's mind. Yeah, as Jarrett mentioned, this is a really interesting thing. Nonprofit Power Week, working with I Bailey specifically on the topic of cybersecurity um, for this whole week. If you've missed an episode or you want to make sure that you don't miss an upcoming episode, go to the nonprofitshow.com where you'll be able to register for reminders, access the library and of the archives. I mean, there are a bunch of different ways to stay with us on this because um, it is really one of those discussions that we're not having enough. And as Kyle has um, educated us in just two short days, the extensive way that this is penetrating our, our uh, nonprofit sector, yeah. changing, and it's it's vast, and so it's been really interesting, Kyle, um, to have you on and and talk with you again today. Kyle Hendrickson, director of cybersecurity, uh, with I Bailey, coming to us. He was live with us in Phoenix right after the show yesterday. Bless his heart. He got on a plane, flew back to North Dakota, and uh, wow. Here he is back with us. And so this has been really interesting. Thank you, Kyle. Well, thank you. And I think one, la one last thought that I'd leave you with is I, we're putting this into context of cyber risk. And we're, we're talking about that all week here. Um, but I think cyber risk is made up too. This is all just business risk. This is impacting our businesses, our communities, and those that we're serving. Yeah, yeah, great point. Yeah. I love how you phrase that. And that that makes it even more um, important to share this concept because it, yeah, because of the impact. So thank you for that. Um, super valuable words. Again, I'm Julia Patrick. I've been joined today by the nonprofit nerd herself, Jarrett Ransom, CEO of the Raven Group. Um, Jarrett Ransom, you have the perfect last name <laughs> for this week, my friend. I know. Wow. I know. I, I couldn't have asked for a better, a better name uh, for this week, but I'm not holding anyone hostage. That's for sure. This is nothing within my wheelhouse. I am learning so much from you, Kyle, truly. I'm so glad that I Bailey, you know, again, as um, as an accounting firm, I mean, I, I send so many clients to them when it comes to audits and just overall financial support to see this marriage and the compliment that it provides to, you know, uh, this risk prevention that is fascinating to me. Yes. And it really just shows that I Bailey is a true partner, um, in the, in the sector. We talk all the time. There's 1.8 million registered nonprofits in the U.S., not to mention those that are not registered, um, but 1.8 million. So we appreciate this nonprofit Power Week and the partnership of Ike Bailey. Yeah, super powerful. Hey, again, we want to thank all of our presenting sponsors who are with us day in and day out. They include Boomerang, Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Your Part-Time Controller, Be Generous, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, and the Nonprofit Nerd. These are the folks that really help us have these conversations. And to remind everyone, Kyle's going to be back. And so if you've got questions for him or comments, go ahead and send them our way. You can access that through the nonprofitshow.com uh, or or connect with us on social because you you know i'm sure as we have there have been a lot of questions that have come up and just new things that we're hearing um, and so we want to make sure that while we have kyle here in the hot seat we get those questions answered well wow. and friday we're gonna put him literally in the hot seat he yeah. and i will uh cover our ask and answer so if you do have a question send that in and we will Add that to our Friday, or as I like to call it, Friday Ask and Answer episode. Yeah, that'll be amazing because um, so much new vocabulary, new concepts, um, but we really need to move this discussion to the top of the heap. Yesterday, 
Um, Jared, you asked me a question at the board service that I do. If, if yeah. you're, if we're being, if we're talking about this or hearing about it and we are not, yeah. not enough. And right. so this is, this is one of those things. Um, well, as we like to end every episode, we want to remind ourselves, our viewers, our listeners, our guests to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow, everyone. Thank you.